who are an elected representative a, um, in the union of the Jawaharlal Nehru University um, at the end of the 80s, at the beginning of the 90s. And I like it. This was a period of great transformation in the, in, in the global and the Indian context, in particular with regards to to the liberalization process as well as the opening of the reservation for unprivileged sections of the population to, to the so-called OBC section. Um, so you were, you were there and you witnessed uh, really, really uh, a lot of discussion uh, 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 regarding, regarding those, those, those issues. So if you could Tell us more about your personal involvement in those in in those days and uh, how a campus like GNU interacted and created his own understanding of of that of that of those two crucial of those, those crucial issues. Well, okay. So just a brief uh, uh, biography. Um, I was uh, a member of the All India Students Federation, which is the student wing of the Communist Party of India. Yeah? Uh, I had joined the AISF when I was in Delhi University. So by the time I came to JNU, I was already uh, a member for seven years. I'm quite an active member at that. Uh, JNU was remarkable for uh, various reasons. One is, um, um, it, um, it had uh, the ability uh, of um, creating a wide um, intellectual culture. Uh, you know, many of the campuses in India at that time, they had these huge issues of violence mm -hmm. and a politics, including the university, that was really um, not open to as intense ideological discussion and debate as Jerry offered. Yeah? Partly, Jerry was just very um, uh, peaceful, it was not a violent place, people could express their points of view, and uh, the basic content of the university was social science as well. Yeah? Uh, but I must, uh, you know, say something uh, before. You know, uh, in a strange way, uh, what I'm going to convey is not necessarily what happened in those days, but how I understood what happened from a perspective of today. So, uh, you know, while I was a student there, many of these uh, reflections, many of these patterns were not visible. But it's much later years that, you know, one makes better sense of what one was going through, yeah? Uh, so, um, in hindsight, if I think about JNU, uh, it was also a campus that accommodated uh, a very diverse population. Uh, you had uh, kids from principally elite families, and you had lots of kids who came from small town India and from rural villages. So there was a very diverse set of uh, cultures on that campus. And in some way, I think a broad, left, progressive, and democratic culture a lot of people who came from very underprivileged backgrounds or difficult backgrounds to have a voice. So, you know, we were not suppressed by someone's wealth. It was the reverse, in fact. There was a lot of uh, regard given to people who didn't have, uh, you know, uh, financial resources or who did not come from elite backgrounds. Yeah? Their voice could be heard because of the kind of politics in that campus. Yeah? That's one. Two is that it was also an unusually uh, uh, um, uh, respectful of gender for its time in India. Like uh, women's hostels did not have, you know, requirements for uh, for women to be in at uh, at ten o'clock, like in the university, or seven o'clock, like in the university. Uh, people could be, uh, you know, awake at all times in the campus. There was a Baba culture. People drank. Uh, they were out in the, you know, discussing. So they were very engaged uh, as a culture, yeah? 
and because people came from different backgrounds, uh, there was much to discuss, uh, interact about, disagree. Yeah? So uh, I think it, there was a culture that bred questioning, that bred um, a respect for difference, and also uh, equally uh, was encouraging of uh, the understanding that politics mattered. Yeah? So in hindsight, I would say it was a perfect place to train citizens and to value uh, democratic uh, disagreement. Yeah? So when, uh, the way I understand it today, historically and ideally, the modern university was between the market and the state. So we could criticize both. We could criticize the market and we could criticize the state. And that was how uh, political citizenship was being created. You know? And I think Jerry really uh, offered that uh, opportunity and potential. So uh, I would say as a university, uh, it really encouraged an idea of India that could negotiate difference, that could celebrate uh, plural uh, and diverse thinking. Even though there was an overall culture of uh, left, but people make a mistake, you know, it's not as in left as in, you know, um, uh, just uh, people wanting to radically overthrow the state or something like that. Uh, in India, there are many issues uh, of injustice, inequality, and a left framework could actually address many of them. Right? By, by, by pointing out that, you know, uh, you have uh, 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 caste oppression, you have uh, economic injustice, you have all levels of inequality. And that needed to be uh, debated, negotiated, challenged. And, um, you know, the left tradition was very helpful in that kind of secular uh, language, uh, right? It was a very helpful way of engaging with those uh, uh, problems of our society and disagreements. Uh, but then also I would say, when young people grow up, you know, you're going to say extreme things, uh, you're going to say harsh things, you're going to... So, uh, uh, if we, if, um, we, if we now take your, your story and your insight outside of the territory of, of, of GNU, yeah. um, would you say that um, university spaces, uh, whether whether they reproduce um, political capital in the form of new leadership for political parties, or or creates a form of citizenship that is not always in tune with the with the dominant narrative? Okay. Um, would you say that the campus spaces uh, outside of, um, of uh, certain institutions such as GNU um, are instrumental in forging in forging a new generation of of um, uh, political of, of political citizens? Okay, let me break that question uh, in a different way. I think uh, today, uh, if you have such high fees, you are trying to reproduce privilege. Okay? Uh, a good public university must produce an informed citizenry. Right? Uh, you cannot produce that by putting people in debt. Okay? JNU did not put us in debt. It gave us ideal conditions in which we could learn, discuss, and debate uh, society's uh, politics. Yeah? I mean, after all, uh, a simple question. What is a nation? A nation is a political community. What is politics? Politics is simply a intense debate over morals and values that a community should, should hold, right? So 
the political citizenship is really a debate about values and morals that the community should have. Should we have a just society? Should we have a society that uh, can um, address uh, historical injustices, historical inequalities? Yeah? Uh, what is the belief in uh, citizenship? Yeah? So many of these things I think JD was able to, to give us. Right? Today it is being finished off because there are some, I mean, this government sees the democracy as a threat. Right? So, uh, that's a big difference. Indeed. Yeah. If you think democracy is a good value to, to preserve and to uh, have, then I think Jerry is an ideal that should be reproduced. I see, I see, I see. If, if, if we now, uh, if we now uh, 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 move to the more historical big stones of um, uh, 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 of this of this interview, um, what uh, what exactly happened in 1989 and 1990 um, that reflected the, uh, the the political scenario of the time and in the, um, um, where the situation in campus enabled a new form of understandings or like different interpretations of um, the then terms of contemporary India. Of course with reference to, to the Mandal Commission and reference to um, to the to the to, to the, the preparation of the liberalization and then the Rao government and then the the also the um, collapse of uh, of um, Soviet Union and um, Tiananmen Square. So this uh, this entire in this entire scenario, what was your personal role in a addressing those issues, what was the atmosphere on campus, and are, are they uh, new interpretation emerging from campus at that time? Okay, very good question. And I must uh, just at the outset declare, you know, that uh, it's one of those years, 1890, um, where I'm still trying to figure out what happened. Okay, it's a, it's it's really uh, something. Uh, I mean, uh, I would say that I'm still constantly revising what I think happened. Yeah, but here's what uh, I must uh, start uh, with hindsight again. I think when those events happened, uh, Tiananmen, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and then the Mandan Commission. Uh, at that time. I don't think I understood anything with hindsight. The conceptual, theoretical, and even practical intellectual equipment that I possessed left me completely unprepared for making sense of these events. Okay, so was, whatever I did was reactive. It was not based on a clear vision as to what was happening. Yeah? So let me explain that even more. So, uh, I was trying to understand things as the problem, like Mandal Commission, I was trying to understand Mandal Commission as a problem of sociology, mm. the politics of sociology. Well, actually, it should have been the politics of geology. Social plates had shifted, they were not simply uh, the epiphenomenon of sociology, you know, caste by you know, an entire uh, uh, social plate had shifted. It needed a geological analysis, not a sociological analysis, in a manner of speaking. So, I completely did not grasp the depth of that um, event. Yeah? So, what happened was, strange things, people who generally uh, championed uh, progressive uh, left ideologies who were for uh, uh, caste and class justice 
suddenly we find them arguing that money was wrong, that it would aggravate the caste crisis. Uh, so, and then the reverse also, people who were on the right side of things on many issues, suddenly shifted and became pro mandal yeah. So, you, uh, it was such a flip over right that you realize that uh, India actually has a, a great uh, sociological depth. And at any given point of time, you are seeing only a little, little top part of the iceberg. Yeah? That actually, the, it does, does, uh, I mean, kilometers that, that goes down deeper than that. Yeah? So as a activist and as a, I was going to jump into the streets, you know, I had no grasp of what the money commission meant. Also partly my background, South Indian, uh, you know, well, I mean, that is that, you know, not a deep understanding of caste either, and Christian backgrounds and so forth. So I was completely caught unaware, completely unprepared, and none of my, uh, you know, I could argue, uh, you know, there's a there, you know, we are, we are basically trying to give a space to what is called the other backward caste in the middle class. You know, that the middle class story in India, they are still <coughs> deluded of, uh, OBCs and it, they needed some going through the uh, UPSC exams. But that's not how some of the uh, upper class uh, saw it. They saw this as that, you know what, this is another attack on them. They have no real assets. They have, this was their only means of livelihood and they being taken by the OBCs. I mean, that was one of the arguments we made. But, um, uh, Jerry went through a huge uh, tumult. Uh, and it tells you how universities are not these bubbles uh, outside the society. Uh, they are actually they with big windows, you know, large forces of society is actually, the society blows in and blows out, yeah. And so, um, it was very difficult, our uh, union actually had to resign because we refused to implement the decision of the, um, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, university body body meeting. Uh, but let me also say the, you know, the UGBL was also managed badly because we were inexperienced. Uh, so sometimes simplified understandings of it actually, if we were a mature political leadership, I thought we could have conveyed and convinced more people. But we were also, you know, like everyone else, completely lost in the. Uh, in the in the madness of the moment, so to speak, yeah, and so we didn't uh, we didn't as, as carefully control that uh, situation, and ultimately we had to resolve. But um, it did show that it needed a um, geological analysis of Indian society, not a sociological analysis. Yeah, but yeah. similarly, similarly. Uh, Follow the burden world, even the big problems that the left was having with trying to uh, think of the world anew. That also was, uh, you know, uh, we had no grasp how uh, we were trying to still understand it as political economy, right? But it, it, it was obviously another huge, uh, dramatic technological shift that was actually taking place over the last uh, decade. You know, the steady uh, creation of the service sector economy that was just beginning to grapple with the outer edges of what then became the great digital age, yeah, uh, digital uh, economy, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and then also was the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the great uh, Bretton Woods, uh, not Bretton Woods, sorry, what is that? Uh, no liberal, uh, the Washington Consensus, sorry, the Washington Consensus. I mean, we, we have no idea that the, that the Reagan and Thatcher were re-scripting uh, the world, yeah? Right? We were still locked in our very furthest, uh, you know, the working class kind of mode, right? So, um, again, uh, totally unprepared uh, intellectually um, for this moment, yeah? So we just reacted to it. We tried our best. We gave arguments that uh, had no appeal because actually things had shifted, right? 
but um, subsequently, uh, you, you might be familiar in India, uh, the, 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 the earthquake happened, uh, everything got shifted, but there was a period when, you know, we were trying to restore, but actually uh, that band-aid wouldn't work. There were deep fractures, deep fault lines that had opened up and were running through the system, you yeah? So, and many of them, I think, played out until quite recently now, you have a clear uh, shift which is going to try and argue that democracy is not needed and that you know, authoritarian uh, leaders and violent populist or fascist, whichever whatever you prefer. We have now uh, no meaning for that world that was assembled uh, after the Second World War. You know? So today, uh, if you were to ask me, 89 was a rupture, very significant rupture. We were completely unprepared ideologically, intellectually, uh, for that moment. Uh, we reacted to it rather than had any kind of commanding vision about uh, what was happening. Yeah? But nonetheless, uh, I, um, I would say that you know, ours is a sociological, I mean, response to the sociology of politics and to the political economy, that is the approach that we had, but it was actually a geological uh, moment. Yeah. 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 It's a deep moment, and we had no, no grasp of it at all. Which then tells you a lot about social sciences. Social science is not predictive. It can be mostly... Uh, speculative and reactive, but not not really predictive. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we uh, we are part so we are part of the old world suddenly <laughs> within within a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, fully and um, fully unable to understand uh, what the uh, the change was happening, what the change that was happening was about. Yeah. I see. I see. The, I have, a, I, uh, you know, this exhibition um, gives uh, a, a strong emphasis on um, uh, archival material, in particular pamphletia material, for which you have uh, extremely kindly uh, 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 donated very important, very important uh, uh, pamphlets, and among them. Um, there is your uh, resignation, there's a, your resignation letter yeah. after the, the, the uh, UGBM in which uh, those supporting, uh, uh, support and member are, are uh, defeated by a majority of students uh, yeah. against, against it. In the tone of this, of this, uh, uh, of this pamphlet, of this letter, which is a public pamphlet, so a letter, was full of uh, the, the the emotion of the moment, the the, the dramatic dramatic as you say geological shift that that is happening and unfolding uh, 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 um, before you, and ultimately the the resignation that that comes through. Um, I wanted to to um, to ask you to to which extent those emotions are part of the pamphleteer style that exists. In the object of the pamphlet itself, as it serves as a as an interaction between the activists and the students, as a tool of socialization, but as, as a tool of expression of the injustice and the the the, 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 the political energy expressing at um, at the time, um, and whether that pamphletier style it goes beyond the pamphlet pamphlet object and also defines a little bit the mode of expression of of activism in those in, in general in Yemen in particular and more specifically in your in, in your in your experience of it the uh, uh, the reaction to, to the, the Mandal Commission. Well you know politics is an art, it's not a science. Uh, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, think of politics as something abstract, formulaic. Uh, yeah, it is actually a arrangement, uh, both at the at the person's subconscious as much as at the conscious level. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so 
uh, emotion, emotional states and a kind of uh, moral idiom that I meant. Yeah, all right? Uh, and they become extremely neat when you argue for uh, higher purpose ideas, ideas that belong to a larger uh, sense of the world, right? Okay, right? Um, so, uh, so the, uh, uh, the whole question of politics being an art uh, is very central to that. Yeah, uh, an emotional, a, a moral, yeah, uh, engagement, right? Uh, it's not, uh, it's not like uh, two words for me because one plus one is two, right? Okay, um, even though a lot of the uh, left language makes all these pretensions about you know, being able to read society scientifically and how um, we need to grasp things uh, through secular reasoning. Uh, that is true, uh, you know, but there's, it's an important element, yeah, uh, because secular reasoning helps you uh, try and not allow any emotions cloud your judgment, yeah. But that has been said, um, that most people is also, uh, you know, uh, a question of uh, moral correctness, moral justice, emotions, yeah, all right, yeah. So in that sense, uh, yeah, yeah. as human, as a human else should be, yeah, mm -hmm. right. So um, I think if you see those pamphlets, I can't remember them now, but I remember that time we were very, very overwhelmed. Uh, by um, by thinking again, you know, how could how could people not want justice? Why should they be so against a a a, a section of society that's been historically deprived? Why should why should you not allow them uh, space uh, in your society or in your world? Yeah, um, but I that thing I still hold. Uh, but um, I will also say this much that you know uh, uh, there was also some indication about how uh, jobs were also a very intense uh, issue. You know, uh, many of the uh, uh, upper caste kids who actually came from very um, borderline middle class families, you know, and for them, uh, urban jobs were make or break affairs. So, uh, any loss in those, what they perceive to be in their, in the only things that they were entitled to, they were also on the edge. You see? Um, so, uh, but we must realize that uh, 89, 90 was also when this whole the economy is going to burst open and create many more different kinds of jobs in the private sector. Yeah? Uh, 89 was still the belief that you know, the real jobs are public sector jobs. The real jobs are with government. The rest is basically uh, just playing, playing with their fate. Yeah? Right? Uh, but um, uh, subsequently, like, when the economy burst open, I mean, uh, liberalized 80 or 90 or 92, you know, many of these, and, and even the money commission thing kind of died down by, by the mid-1990s, you know. The private sector just burst open, and there were so many jobs, and, and so many new kinds of jobs, uh, that uh, government did not, ha I mean, it did become desirable for lower middle classes, but at least the elites began to really want to move on from government positions. Mm -hmm. okay. the, 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 this, it is fascinating to see that among uh, the, 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 the JNU student leadership, especially within the life ranks, there has been really few activists, in fact, that uh, join public public jobs, um, civil service, uh, for instance, uh, after after their uh, their junior years, 
did you did you sense um, the ideological political reluctance to um, to uh, uh, to join the, the public sector? Um, and beyond that, what was um, what was the perception of the to come reforms uh, 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 that later will be called organization in in the campus space? Uh, well, I, mean, I think uh, many of them did join. I mean, the civil services. There are many. Uh, I mean, I think uh, I remember there was uh, the eighty-three batch. Uh, uh, General Secretary of the Island National Federation and before to join the railways, there were people who joined huh, uh, the public sector, uh, civil services, but I think the majority remained academics. In, in fact, yes. 60% 60 percent, 60 of those who uh, had um, office bureau positions in, in GMU from 71 to 2018 have teaching positions. Oh, really? Yes. What is that? That's a great statistic. That should be. I should think that that's amazing. Uh, it's a, it's, it's depending on how you count it. It's from fifty to sixty. I uh, I can send you the statistics. It's from my PhD. You can you can. Oh yeah, yeah. Please. That would be, yeah, we should have newspaper piece on that. that. That's an amazing story by itself. Why? Uh, and and, and you are talking about office bearers, people who were. Yeah. No, on, only those who. Uh, because th then it's difficult to yeah, yeah, yeah. define to define who, who was exactly an activist or not. So I just took office bearers. Like I'll tell you from in my own batch, uh, uh, I was a general secretary, yeah, okay. But I ran in our uh, our uh, 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 union. Um, I think the majority of them are in academia. There's Sumaila Ganadri in academia. Uh, there is um, like Malika Kasturi was a was a counselor. She is teaching in Toronto. Uh, there is another Shubha again teaching in the US. <laughs> and and many many of them uh, are teaching in uh, very prominent universities abroad. It's not like they're only teaching in India. Yeah. So I mean there is a lot to be said about uh, the quality of uh, uh, the uh, the uh, 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 union office bearers and uh, the fact that they are uh, you know uh, academics also, right? So um, uh, I don't think there was a there was any uh, you know the, I mean we didn't really hold uh, a lot of people giving UPSC in high regard or something like that. I mean that's not it was criticism and so on and so forth. But there was no effort at least by the time I was there. That, you know, we, we, we said oh, we should have done UPC, but there was no such, uh, uh, you know, uh, nobody, uh, uh, there, was no, there was no attempt to prevent people from doing the UPC exams or whatever. Uh, the academic uh, calling, I think, is, is maybe linked to a sense of what you begin to value after some time. Yeah? All right. Um, could I be doing something else? Possibly not. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and then there are sort of you know good circumstances and sure luck and so on and so forth. You know that that give you the job or whatever. Uh, but I think um, I think the fact that you know you begin to have to be very um, busy in writing, arguing. Discussing uh, these maybe just surprise you in a certain way for an academic position, yeah, right. And uh, you know, all of us have to give speeches. You begin to learn how to do that. It's like you can even go to the classroom, and it's very helpful, yeah. But uh, you, you can speak in class and speak, yeah. So um, at least in my case, um, I think. One set of uh, concerns gave way to another set of concerns. Uh, I, I also add this the fact that I was not in debt, the fact that I did my PhD on such ridiculous, I mean, I should say ridiculous, I, it's an incredibly generous uh, um, 
kind of uh, commitment by the Indian state that you pay, I don't know, some 600 rupees a semester or 15 rupees a month, and you get a quality education, the, one of the best in the world, okay? Uh, and uh, you work your PhDs, your, uh, your MPs, your all your engagement of a very high quality, thanks to a lot of your professors also, you know, who are all very accomplished. Uh, and you know, one more thing about Jonia, even as, I, as a general secretary, when I was in the classroom, when I met my, my, my supervisor now, it, it didn't matter. You better deliver on the paper, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't see class if you don't, uh, you know, crack up on your abilities, yeah? Right? And it was an embarrassment if you did not, uh, if you did not do well academically as well. You know? Um, so, uh, um, in fact, uh, so I did very badly in school, and I did really badly in college, before I got involved in politics. And after I got involved in politics, uh, political level, I started doing well in school, uh, I started doing well in research and PhD and in academia. You know what I'm saying? That an engagement with life at this level actually turned into academic. Definitely. It's actually a good thing, I know. I mean, some people are not take, take highly of being an academic, but uh, to me, there's a clear correlation between uh, political engagement and academic uh, training and learning. Yeah? Definitely, even though, even though later on, if the emergence of uh, uh, alternative left in group that emphasis uh, became less prominent in my in my understanding of it but more like ASF and SFI form of political engagement uh, was giving a lot of emphasis on the interplay between the study and struggle as, as the slogan goes Oh, but that later on, with, with uh, for instance, Isa in campus, that emphasis, that emphasis on this balance or this uh, in inter interaction between good studies and good activism uh, became more unbalanced, and that the, the premium of selfless commitment yeah. became more prominent as compared to uh, to, to to the the old. Uh, ASF, SFI approach to, to, to activism. Well, I think this has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, ISA actually grew uh, by a large part of their initial activists coming from much more poor backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, more intensely poor backgrounds than some of the ASF, SFI guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we were mostly middle class. 